Steven's doing some directing or something. They're like, Steven, Steven, we have to show you something. And then they're like, Rufio. And then I, I walk out behind like the camera area. And Steven turns around and he's like, Yes. <laughs> <laughs> It's all good. Rufio's cool. You're walking around with a three a trihawk on or something like oh you got red and black on at a Comic Con, they're like, that's Rufio. Yeah. And that's cool. So but at fifteen, a vulnerable fifteen year old, it was nerve wracking. Yeah. Nerve wracking. That's awesome. Um uh, for uh, Jumanji, I knew it was gonna be a huge film. Like because I'd done a bunch of stuff, some T V and stuff like that, but until I went in to the production office for one of the callbacks for that, usually when you walk in, it just looks like a regular office. Maybe there's some artwork from posters that, you know, other movies that that producer had done or whatever. But I walked into this production office for Jumanji, and it was a bunch of offices around the center space. It was probably about this size. And all around it were models of the house and all of this concept art and these sketches. And they had um, maquettes, which are like um, little mini versions of like what the crocodiles were going to look like and stuff and it was like this is a museum to this movie that doesn't even exist yet mm -hmm. and i didn't know it at the time but joe johnston who directed the film did most of the concept stuff for star wars mm -hmm. so i'm looking around going and this was the kind of stuff that was out there it was all these miniatures and stuff I'm like, wow this is really cool so i knew then that it could be huge but like as far as my character be in a big thing, or, you know, that kind of like, because we do all want to do something that is remembered, that little piece of immortality that you can get out of a big project, and it was, I didn't realize it was going to be what it was, same with Beauty and the Beast, I had no idea that that was going to be a huge thing that, you know, people are still remembering 25, 30 years later, it's just, I mean, yeah, Disney films, they get remembered, but Beauty and the Beast was one of those ones that really sticks out for everyone, which was very cool. You said the reunion. Uh, yeah, we just did the uh, 25th anniversary screening, which was the first time in 14 years I had seen most of the cast, um, but they were all there. I mean, all of them that uh, could have made it. Uh, ran into Angela again, which was cool. Um, Paige O'Hara, Robbie Benson, they were all there. And uh, Don Hahn, who was the producer. Like, to get all of us back in a room again, and it's been 25 years, and everybody has changed, but yet they're still. You know, there's something about, yeah, because we all kind of become that version of ourselves, too, in that space, which was really cool. Um, yeah, and got so many great memories from working with all these people and yeah, totally. growing up in the business. It's, it's a very different thing, but it's almost like you've got these different families. Each movie gets, you get so close with the other people that you work with. It's friendships that last forever. And it's very yeah. So, I have to ask, I'm sure a lot of people want to know, what was it like working with Robin? Uh, working with Robin was awesome. Um, he's, he's one of my favorite people that I've ever worked with. Um, I was 12 when I worked with Robin, and he very much kind of had that father figure thing uh, in my eyes, because um, at the time, I, uh, my dad passed away when I was young, so I didn't have a, a dad. So he kind of was that um, mentor or that guy at that point. He was somebody that I really looked up to. And he was so generous with um, with his knowledge and with his time. Uh, by the end of the six months that it took us to film Jumanji, I really felt like I knew him as a person. Um, because at the beginning, he was always in character. He was always the funny man, Robin Williams. Uh, and it wasn't until, you know, three months in, four months in, as I started to get to know him, and as I guess he started to get to know and be more comfortable with me. I mean, like, there was a day uh, he and I and his uh, eldest son, Zachary, who's about my age, uh, went to the zoo together up in Vancouver. And we just hung out for the day. And he was just a dad and a cool guy, you know, and that was a lot of fun. And then people would come up to him occasionally, and as long as they were cool, he would definitely take pictures and stuff. But I remember there was one, uh, this one couple came up, and they were like basically grabbing him to try to take this picture. He's like, 
Who is this Robin William? Who is this? <laughs> he was completely uncooperative. <laughs> completely blue. Uh, acted like he had no idea what they were talking about. Speaking <laughs> in some gibberish version of an Eastern European language. And it was awesome. <laughs> um, and uh, his son's acting like I was just trying to figure out what the hell was going on. But it was so much fun. Crazy. When I was when I worked with Robin, I was 15, and uh, yeah, dude, the, the thing about Robin, he, he everything you want him to be, as far as like the funny man and the energy, and you know, from Mork and Mindy to like the genie in Aladdin, like that. I mean, he is that, right? There's a big part of him that's that, and being on the set, he actually taught me a lot about how to be a, you know, how to be a star, how to be an actor, how to kind of keep the morale of the set going. Shooting movies is fun, but also, you know, we shoot 14 hours a day, 16 hours a day sometimes. And a lot of times the morale of the set is right off the stars of the movie. And the director, it's like, if you're having a bad day, the whole set's going to have a bad day. And that's not fair for everybody. So he's the kind of guy that's, like, keeping everybody. He knows everybody on the set. He's cracking jokes all day long, keeping everybody just in a good mood to do their best work. Um, so you, you get that aspect of it, but also... Spending so much time with him, uh, away from that, you kind of get to see other sides of him, right? So for me, going into it, uh, Dead Poet Society is one of my favorite movies. It still is one of my favorite movies. And I'm a poet, so we would talk a lot about poetry. We would spend the mornings talking about poetry, about his favorite poets, my favorite poets. Um, he, he ended up giving me, for my rap present, this really beautiful leather-bound Walt Whitman book, Leaves of Grass. And... And like part of my whole life as a poet afterwards is part of like the support of Robin Williams, you know. So it's one of those things where I like you know, when I tell the story of my poetry venue that became this really huge uh, like venue in the country. It's like that's also part of like the legacy of Robin Williams too. So um, let's talk a little bit too about your anime work. You were Tails. People didn't know he was Hedgehog. Yeah. I always ask this, I can never remember. You, you were on the darker Sonic, right? Not the. Yeah, I was on the weird. Saturday uh, Saturday morning uh, one. Uh, Jaleel White was my Sonic. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I was on that for a few years. And actually, uh, they replaced me as Tails vocally when I was filming too much. Yeah. Because I was gone for six months. Um, but then uh, by the time I'd finished Jumanji, they canceled the show, but I was I was on it for about three years, I think, something something like five seasons, mm -hmm. um, and that was really cool, that was a great experience, because uh, I don't know how most of your voice stuff was, but for that one, they had all of us in the room together, mm -hmm. um, which, unlike Beauty and the Beast, Beauty and the Beast, everybody recorded separately, uh, for uh, Sonic the Hedgehog, everybody was in the same room, so it was cool, because we'd go around, and I had Jim Cummings, was usually on the mic to my right, um, and then uh, uh, Gray Delisle and Christine Kavanaugh. Like, at the time, I knew who these people were in the room, but I didn't care who they were outside the room. I looked back and I'm like, Dude, all of those cartoons that I watched, all of these people were those people. <laughs> <laughs> like, Jim Cummings was Uncle Jack or Monterey Jack at all these shows, like, baffled me. But yeah, like, I realized it after the fact how amazingly cool it was that I was in that room with those people. But yeah, lots of fun. Yeah, no, those guys are legends. Yeah, they're awesome. And uh, same thing. I mean, I tripped into the the whole voiceover world. You know, people are like, "How do you get a voiceover?" When you're acting, there's uh, you know, of course, everyone knows there's film and television, and there's commercials, and then there's hosting, and then there's print it, print ads, and then there's this section for a lot of years is like a really small section called voiceover where if you want to do that part of it, your agency is like, all right, cool, but not a lot of people are doing it. Somehow, you know, it's a very small clique of people, and once you're kind of in that clique, like all of a sudden, you know, whatever, you're like hanging out with these legends sometimes. Yeah. Um, and I've been lucky that some of the things I've done, you know, gone to series, and I've got to do a bunch of years. I think Avatar we did for the better part of a decade, almost eight years, because we did both. We did Airbender, and then we did, came back and did Korra, and I got to come back and do Korra. So it's crazy. It's cool. Yeah. And Great Allow played my sister in, in, and she played Azula. It's great. Great, great Yeah. But uh, yeah, the voice of the world's crazy. And then touring, and then like doing cons, you kind of get to tour with all these like great actors, especially a lot of great voiceover actors, and kind of get to hang out with them socially. 
which could be good sometimes and crazy sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I, uh, I haven't really done the con circuit, and I haven't done much voiceover lately, so I haven't gotten that yeah. experience as an adult. And you're, that's why I think <laughs> your kids, yeah. as a kid, you're, 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 you're one kind of way with all the actors, right? Yeah. But as you grow up, all of a sudden, like, relationships change. And it's, I started acting when I was 10, you started when you were 6. Yeah. So there's a lot of people I know that know me from that time in my period, and then my life, and then, you know, now you're like all adults hanging out, you know, in some foreign land. Yeah. <laughs> Things can happen. <laughs> yeah, questions. All right, guys, questions. Anybody want to ask questions, please? Don't get bad here. Start. Kind of don't be shy. Throw your hands up. We're in church. Technically. Yeah, really? Nobody? No questions. Wow. Oh, yeah, you're in the back. Did you guys date any celebrities? Dating <laughs> 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 guys. That's the question of the day. <laughs> camera in the room, what's going on? All right, let's talk about that portion. Uh, <laughs> um, I actually did not. Um, I Everybody that I dated was outside the uh, acting realm. Um, the uh, closest I ever got was... Uh, Kirsten and I talked about dating during Jumanji. We almost kissed. But, uh, <laughs> there it was. But no, that, never dated or uh, hooked up with uh, anybody else in uh, Kind of almost Michelle Trachtenberg, too. But that was after a Nickelodeon thing I did. And we, we were, and all the Nickelodeon premieres and events together. Yeah. Oh. yeah we, we, would only run in, we would only run into each other at the premieres. Yeah. <laughs> No, I dated a few girls. <laughs> 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 Not that. that might be a yes. I don't know. <laughs> I dated a few girls. I don't know. You know, I grew up in the 90s, so there's like a generation of that kind of clique that, you know. I grew up like in the club scene. We hung out. I, I, I loved dancing. I was a dancer, so I did. I dated some girls. <laughs> you know? So, yeah, I mean, I'll kiss and tell. <laughs> <laughs> I know who you are. Later there. No, I grew up dating a lot. I mean, I would date a lot of actresses and dancers because that's kind of who you. That's kind of who you hung out with, right? And of course, on sets, that's kind of who you were working with. And then, you know, you're just young and just. I mean, there's like, we have trailers. <laughs> it's innocent to a certain degree, but you know, it's like you when you're coming of age. On a set, you know, I started when I was ten. So like, when you're coming of age on a set, and it's like all the kids were in school together, and then you know, you just want to make out stuff, play spin the bottle. It's just the same thing that all kids do. It's just like you're just now doing it like in trailers on the set instead instead of instead you know of on the quad. Someone, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're just playing spin the bottle in someone's trailer. But yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, is it is it a trip for you at all, like to see like so for example like cosplayers and stuff like that as Rufio? And I want to know if anyone ever brought it to your attention. There's a pro wrestler in the WWE by the name of Xavier Woods yeah, yeah, who that. did your who did his entrance at a pay per view recently dressed like Rufio. So it, like so that's just thing. So is it just a trip for you to see that throughout the generation? Yeah, it's a trip. Like I mean, at first it was you know at first it was kind of crazy. You know, like when you're a kid, like it's weird, right? Because you're I mean, you know, you have an action figure. Mm -hmm. Like, that's, that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> I think it really, yeah. I think even more than the action figure that tripped me out is the, the McDonald's happy meal. Like, yeah. I'm in a McDonald's happy meal. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy, right? And then, um, and then back in those days, before like the Comic Con thing blew up, it was just like around Halloween, people would send you pictures of like a costume. And it's kind of, it's flat, I mean, it's flattering. It's like, oh, that's cool. Now it's like all around, like Xavier thing was crazy, mm -hmm. my Twitter blew up and stuff when that happened. And, uh, it's just flattering. I think the craziest thing now, what you see is, um, you know, people sending pictures of tattoos, right? Uh, so it's like Rufio tattoos. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I did a blog about it on my blog. It's like, you know, you're officially a part of pop culture. It's like when you know is when someone tattoos you <laughs> on their body. So like all these. You know, guys and girls would like, you know, my 15 year old face. All <laughs> 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 um, various parts of their body, like Bangarang or like All Girls and Pirates or, or some, one of the cool lines or something from the movie. 
And it's cool, but it's just also crazy because it's like, you're on their body, right? <laughs> um, and I never saw it in person. I've only seen it online, but I was on this last tour. Some guy came in, and, he, and I had, he had my, my mug on his, the back of his cap. He <laughs> said, banger And I was like, that's dope. And, but you just think, and some girls sent me one recently on, on Instagram, like on the big one on her thighs. And you just think like, I'm with you when you're naked. When <laughs> 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 you're naked, you take a shower. I'm just <laughs> 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 to wash that area, <laughs> keep that spot on your body nice and shiny. You know, it's kind of odd. It's a weird thing. But I mean, at the same time, you just you know you're flattered that again, like people. You know, you're. I have tattoos, so I know how how important the tattoos I have are for me. So it's just an honor to be like, oh, like. That character needs something to do on that square. And then print Zuko stuff. And fans are crazy. And I've signed some things or wrote honor on people's bodies and then they just tattoo it. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's not crazy, but you know, whatever. Fans fun. love it. Yeah. Um, a friend of mine um, has uh, had tattooed Chip on her. Um, and I know a few other people with chip tattoos. I don't know anybody with a Jumanji tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> I know people who have like the dice or like a token, but yeah. not, not me. Not <laughs> quite as iconic as Rufio. Uh, but uh, yeah, there's there's some chip tattoos out there that people show me and stuff, which is cool. I feel like I've seen some chip yeah. tattoos. <laughs> you, probably, you probably have. He's actually got one. Yes, I'm going to show you. Um, <laughs> My question's for both of you, actually. I've heard from like some video game voice actors that it's a little more difficult to do voice acting like in a sound by yourself versus like in a group. What do you guys think? Like, was it harder to be by yourself? Or, like, I don't know, what the energy is different? Depends on the day. Um, <laughs> it depends on the day, it depends on the project. Um, a lot of times the advantage for me to working solo in a booth is I'll do um, a series of takes of one line. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll hit uh, one line three times and then get some notes and get adjusted and do it again. Whereas with the round robin or the, or the group, it's usually you just go through the script as though it were the scene. Mm -hmm. um, there's advantages to both of them. The energy is easier to get when you're in the group, but you know, getting the right reading tends to be a little easier in the threes. Um, one of my favorite stories from uh, recording Beauty and the Beast actually came out of that set of three mentality. Um, and I'll go back to that in a second. I won't let him feel the... Uh... Go, go ahead, okay, go cool. Ahead. All right, I'll do it. Um, during the recording, uh, one of the recording sessions, they had added the line, uh, his mustache tickles, mama, when Maurice is drinking out of the teacup. And uh, I was seven years old at the time, and one of my line readings was, his mustache tickles, mama. <laughs> <laughs> Same reaction <laughs> in the booth. Uh, I'm sitting there and everybody in the booth is laughing. <laughs> what? What? What's funny? I'll tell you when you're older. <laughs> that actually ended up becoming that sequence in the movie. What? What's there, Mama? We'll tell you when you're older, Jen. <laughs> they grew out of a flubbed line during that set of three. For me, I'm just reading it. And I didn't know exactly what we were trying to do, so... But it was funny. Back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think initially when you're doing a series, especially, it's they're trying to get everybody in the same room because you're trying to establish that relationship and rapport with everybody. And uh, it, it, it's easier because you know when you're acting, like it's better to act and react. And your your performance is not just your performance. Your performance is coupled to everybody else's performance in the room. It's like <coughs> we're doing this together. <coughs> that being said, sometimes once you're in it, you know, second, third season in or whatever, and schedules, it gets rough, right? Like, I think in Avatar, the third season or something like that, I did pretty much the whole season away because I was shooting <coughs> Take the Lead Toronto, and I would slip off the set like once a week to, to do all my lines. And you can actually get, you know, when you're with when you're with the whole group, you know it's going to take three hours-ish to do a whole episode because you're going through the whole script over and over again, as opposed to when you're doing it solo, you probably get your whole lines done like under an hour, 30 yeah. minutes. 30 to 45. And sometimes you're in the episode like three, four lines. <laughs> so you're like, uh oh, let me just say my three, four lines, I'm out of here. As opposed to like you're in the group and you're like, I'm going to sit around. <laughs> Can I get a cup?
coffee and a cappuccino. <laughs> um, but that happens. But it, but it also takes a really amazing uh, voice director. We had Andrea Romano that was our voice director for Avatar. Because, you know, she's really threading and cutting. She's understanding what they said last week and what you're saying. Like, she has all the notes to kind of make sure it all stitches together, you know? Um, but there's pros and cons. Like I said, there's pros and cons to each way. I prefer, I always, I love actors, and I love being in a room with people, so I've always preferred, like, there's a whole socializing, there's a whole social aspect of, uh, of being in the room together. Everyone catches up on each other's lives, who they're dating. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, this is for Bradley. Um, did Disney like let any of the cast, like the original cast, know that they were redoing it? Um, they talked to some. Um, I know they talked to Angela because uh, her vocals for um, uh, one of the songs. But uh, as far as like talking to all of us, um, I didn't know anything about it until I started hearing about it through you know friends of friends and through the internet and stuff like that. But um, it's uh, it's an interesting thing because as much as you are a part of it, it's not not yours. Yeah. You know, so uh, we all knew about it in different ways, but it wasn't like Disney called and said, hey, we're redoing the movie. Um, when they did sequels to Beauty and the Beast, they reached out to us. Uh, I actually got the first shot at uh, the sequel, uh, but I couldn't do the voice anymore. So. <laughs> but it, uh, you know, no, they didn't reach out, uh, at least not that I'm aware of. Yeah. It, to the original. So. Yes, in the back. With um, people who were actors earlier than you guys, so they were older than you. So they were actors, childhood actors earlier, and had a lot of problems with things like individuals and contracts. And do you guys feel like you were treated fairly, and you know, it kind of yeah. all of the legal stuff was in your favor? Because all the laws regarding childhood actors yeah. changed so much, so dramatically. Um, so just kind of what was that experience like as a kid growing into an adult? Yeah, I mean, by the time I was uh, like in the industry, a lot of it was you know, set. There's, the, there's these rules, like a portion of your check has to go into a savings account until you're 18. And, um, there's the hours of having how long you can work and all that kind of stuff. I mean, people fudge certain things. I mean, it's just part of you're on the set in another country and people are like, well, this is the deal. And I'm like, all right, whatever. <laughs> And yeah. you're, you're treated like an adult to a certain degree, for yeah, sure. Very much. Um, I mean, no. Um, as far as what the laws are, the laws are really well written <coughs> for the most part. There are a lot of cases where uh, production will try and get around it or get an extra hour or whatever. Um, especially in, uh, at least in my experience, some of the more on location stuff. It's like. This is our last day here. We've got three shots left to get. It's gonna be an hour and a half. Can we please just have you just and you know, usually what happens is the parents talk, the teacher the teacher gets you have a in teacher on, it. on the set. Your teacher's basically your social worker also. Yeah. Both. <laughs> <laughs> she actually is your social worker and your teacher. So she knows all the rules too. Yeah, and so they're like, okay, so technically we can't do this, but here's the deal, they're gonna extend this and then you get an egg. Basically it's like, let's get most done. of the time it's not a problem. Yeah. Um, there was only one case that I ever had where they were asking for more time and it really was an issue. It was actually during Jumanji. Uh, it was during the last day of the monsoon scene. Um, and basically what it was is, that was a Friday. We were scheduled to finish the monsoon scene and be out of the wave tank at the University of British Columbia by that Monday. It was done. If we didn't finish this last scene, these last two shots that they needed, we would have to hold everything and come back Monday and... Like, it costs hundreds of thousands of dollars to bring everybody back, plus they'd have to rent the right. space for a whole new week. And so the production uh, came, you know, okay, so we need to stay extra, we need to do this and that. Um, Kirsten and I were both exhausted. We were both sick. Uh, we'd been wearing wetsuits. We'd been in the water every day for two weeks straight. It had been a very long set of weeks. Um, I didn't see it happen, but apparently what happened was Robin Williams found out that they were talking to us about staying longer, and he tore into the producers about it and said, no, we're not working extra time. We will come back next week, and we will do what we need to do. We are all tired. We have all been in the water too long, and it is not going to happen. We cannot keep these kids longer. We're all going home. 
And so we did. Because Robin Williams was allowed to say things like that. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, he he stepped up and he got us all offset and we ended up going back the next day on the next week on Monday and reshoot it. And it worked out great. But um, usually it's there's a little bit of wiggle room in the legal pieces of it. Um, it's filmmaking though, a yeah, lot of stuff happens. When, you, when you're with filmmaking, is like a lot, you know, as much as some have big budgets, it's all, all filmmaking is like a little village of people getting together with a like-minded concept and hopefully everyone's cool and yeah. try to, tries to get it done, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And there's wiggle room, there's like legality, there's certain things, there's overtime, there's things that happen, there's certain times you do a lot to people. As a kid, even as an adult, there's things that go on. And as I write and produce now, we're in the same position a lot of times too, you know. And it's crazy, but it's also crazy. Like in the NFL, like it's crazy. And one time I'm like this, just, this one guy had to do something. He's like, "Yo, man, can you do this, this, and that?" And like, we can't afford this, this. And I'm like, <clears throat> I said, you know what? It's communication. Where I'm like, I'll do it. Like, I'm gonna stay extra. I'll come early. You got to say that money. What you gonna do? This? He's like, "Okay, well, you need anything?" Like we got drink, cocaine, we got girl. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm like, you can save that. But that's how it is. It's kind of like there's a there's that rock and roll crazy aspect of filmmaking too, where it gets can, can get crazy depending on you know. That's why you kind of have to keep your own yeah, you, you gotta keep your own bubble. Keep your own bubble sometimes. But um, as a kid, to to that particular question, as far as how the law works to protect kids and. Um, at least in my experience, it works pretty well. I yeah. mean, there's always ways around things, but usually it's, <coughs> what it comes down to is, if I was really tired and I really couldn't do it anymore and didn't want to, my mom or the teacher would pull the trigger and say, no, we can't do it. Right. We're going home. But 99% of the time, it's so much fun and there's so much energy and we're, you know, I love doing it. Right. So, yeah, let's stick around. Let's do this. Um, and the money aspect of it, yeah. money goes into a Coogan account. Um, the residuals are not mandatory, Coogan, uh, but, you know. Yeah, but there comes a time. It is interesting, too, when you're a kid, you know, you start making a lot of money, and, uh, they, you know, you're paid like an adult. So there's an aspect of you that, especially when you get to, like, your teenage age and you've been around the industry, you're expected to act like an adult and stuff. I mean, it's fun. You're having a good time, but at the same token, mm -hmm. we're all very aware, like, we're all professional actors here. You're working with other professional actors, it's like... It's it's a very strange dynamic, you know what I'm saying? And uh, for kid actors, it's, it's 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 interesting because you become breadwinners in your house. You're you know the life is different, you know what I'm saying? So you you gotta balance that with everything. That's just part of that's just part of you know part of growing up a child actor. And some people do better with it. Some people you know some people it's a couple of things. Um, and that's another piece of it too. Is all of it is. Yeah, we didn't have normal childhood experiences. There's a lot of stuff that we didn't do. I don't know if you went to your prom. I didn't go to mine. Mm -hmm. I did. I made it to prom. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but it's, you know, there's a lot of stuff that we didn't do. But then again, you know, by the time I was 16, I had been to five continents. I, I cruised around the world. I spent six months in London. I spent five months in Australia. Right, that's amazing. I mean, it's, it's, it's give or take. Like, it's like, I couldn't do any team sports because you're just not going to be there for practice. Yeah. I did leave girls at certain dances. It's Oof. horrible, dude. Oh. <laughs> like, you just were supposed to make it and then you just couldn't get off the set in time and then it's just. Yeah. A girl crying in front of the ring. A little normal. In a little dress. Sorry, I didn't do like, <laughs> It just happened. I mean, you give up a certain amount of your teenage years to pursue your career kind of thing. Yeah, it's, and it, it's like that for, you know, it, it's a career. It's a career if you're a kid, it's a career if you're an adult. And sometimes you're gonna give stuff up for whatever it is you're doing, you know? Yeah, we would all love to do certain things, but it was a very different experience than, you know, my non-industry friends, but it's not one I would give up for. It was so much fun, there was so like many. Now looking back, it's like, there's yeah. moments, believe me, when you're a kid, there's moments that you really, I've been fighting with my parents about certain things because it's like you're just missing so many things with your friends. But you know, you look back now, you're like, I would trade it. What's in the moment how things work out? Yeah. Yep. Awesome. Yes. Do you guys have like a favorite scene from Jumanji and Cook that you guys got to film? Yeah. I mean, 
I think all sword fighting. I love the sword fighting. Like when I when I watch the movie now, like the sword fighting, I'm always real proud of because I trained so much sword fighting. Me and Robin, like before, before we started shooting, I think they brought me like six weeks early to just start training sword fighting. So me and Robin would get together in Culver City, this place, Westside Fencing Academy, and like really learn how to sword fight. And of course, being a kid that grew up loving Star Wars and Robin Hood movie, you know, all that Three Musketeers is like, yeah, it's like a dream come true. You get a sword fight in a movie, like for real. And um, and then I trained like for those for that like, two months, and then throughout we shot for eight months. So like, um, they got me. They pulled me out of school every day to sword fight like nonstop. So every sword fighting you see Rufio do in the movies, me. And so it's like really, I love. I mean, those scenes are like I love. You know. So you did your own stunts. I did not all my own. I didn't do the trapeze stuff. Matter of oh. fact, one of the trapeze dudes fell into some rocks and was like, Ooh! Ooh. Everyone, <laughs> off the stuff. Everyone get off the things. Everyone do the set. Yeah. Stuff was really I know, but he didn't hear it. It's Richie. He was, he was, he, I had doing that stuff. I just oh. did all the sword fighting most That's cool. Yeah. Um, my favorite scene to film was the monsoon scene. I just, <laughs> <laughs> we were swimming around in a giant, giant, giant pool. Um, we were doing cannonballs off the second floor, down the staircase. Um, I mean, it, just, it was such a surreal and crazy experience. Uh, that one was awesome. Um, it was also the most obnoxious the makeup ever got. Because the, the muzzle, the nose of that would fill up with water. And then after like an hour when the glue would break down, it would fill up and then it would drain down. But, but that was the most fun to film. Um, and. Uh, the scariest one to film was the car scene, the one where it shoots inside as the stampede runs over. Because they had me in this car and they uh, had an air cannon that was firing sand that was going to blow out this window over here, and then they had somebody that was going to blow out the window in front of me, and I'm like, if I missed my choreography at any point, I was like, I knew they had it, the stunt guys were on their business, but it's still, you know, it's a 12-year-old kid, you're like, wait, you're going to fire a cannon behind my head? What? <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of fun. Oh, uh, yeah, that's right. Um, the house for Jumanji, was that uh, the inside? Was it a set or was it? Uh, um, the, there was a few different versions of the set. Um, all, of the, all of the interiors were sets. Uh, one was built at the, uh, the Bridge Studios in Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, and we had first floor with the bottom of the second. We had the second floor uh, and the attic, and then an entirely separate set for the library. Um, laid out across this long uh, sound stage. The sound stages at the Bridge uh, Studios are not like they are here. They're not boxes. They used to use it to build uh, naval ships. So they're like, you know, 400 yards long and 30 yards long. So there was just all these houses lined up. Um, and uh, so that was the main filming area was at that sound stage. Uh, again, they built the bottom floor and part of the second floor at the University of British Columbia's wave tank for the monsoon scene. Uh, and all of the exteriors were just a facade on the street of Summer Mall. The exteriors for the city, excuse me, were in Keene, New Hampshire. All right, probably come up in minutes for, yes. Um, so I'm an artist, and um, Robin Williams was a really big inspiration as far as and his contributions to the animation world. Um, and a lot of things that people knew him for was his improv. Uh, could you either guys go into a story where he may have improv a scene that was probably too raunchy or something got cut or maybe was put in, <laughs> you know, from working with him? Yeah, man, he... <laughs> yes. Every take. I mean, every, I mean, every scene is like, he'll like, when he turns, he's like, that it means, you know, he's like, Steve, we're going to do one more. Well, that one more means I'm going to do something that's not written. Everything not written. written. All bets are off. Yeah, and as like an actor, you're just like, uh, buckle up, you guys. <laughs> God knows what we're going to do. I mean, I remember, like, the insult scene. Like, I didn't even know. I didn't know what half the things he was talking about. <laughs> he just kept coming out with all different kind of stuff, and I'm just like, uh, you lewd crude bad. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but he's just brilliant. Like, he's arguably the greatest improv actor ever. So he, he brought that to, to everything. Yeah, um, there were a lot of moments uh, where things would get completely derailed because um, not only Robin, but also Bonnie Hunt 
uh, BB Newer, David Unger, they were all from that world of improv comedy. So, um, I mean, Robin was obviously the main culprit, but it would start to go a little bit off the rails because of something Robin would say or do, and then Bonnie would come in with something else. And Kirsten and I are sitting there going, what? what? What's going on? Because <laughs> it was all above our heads, uh, content and everything else. Was like, we can't keep up. <laughs> so we would just try to stick to what our lines were. Some of the takes would just end up being, yeah, well, let's just try that again. Because we were just too far off. Um, but yeah, a lot of the moments, I'd say probably in Jumanji, about 20% of all of his lines were either completely off script or a modification of what was in the script. Just because that was, that was the way things worked. They would, he would do his things and just run. And they worked. It was great. Thank you. Yeah. For Dante, uh, do you still have the Rufio outfit? <laughs> yeah. No? Or the sword? I have the sword, though. The sword? I do have the sword. Oh, that's awesome. I have the sword, and uh, actually, there's. I actually dressed up. I dressed up. Well, coming out soon is like. They got all, it's the 25th anniversary of Hook this year, so they. Uh, they Some production company and entertainment tonight and stuff, they got all the Lost Boys back together. Like 25 years later, and they got us all dressed up. <laughs> like mid drift and armored that. <laughs> and so they, we did we did a bunch of pictures, uh, like reenacting some of the pictures from Hook. Um, so that'll be coming. I think comes out next in August, some sometime soon. Uh, yeah, I mean I don't know how they look. It looked crazy that they put they dressed us all up. <laughs> all it's like the twins, all the lost boys. It was cool to see a lot of these kids I haven't seen in like 20 years, 20 plus years, and uh, everybody kind of grown up and we're wearing the outfits again. It was, it's comedy. <laughs> <laughs> it was comedy. I'm like, I don't know, this looks crazy. Do we look crazy? We look crazy. <laughs> I, I think they look a little crazy, but who knows? <laughs> Alright, probably time for one or two more questions, so let me ask something. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, there's lots of stuff I still want to do. Yeah. Um, but uh, I actually have I've been sort of bugging to try to get some sort of cameo in the Jumanji remake. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, no, they're going in a completely different direction. It's probably not going to work. I'm still trying. <laughs> um, the Jumanji remake is... Uh, they were scheduled to start shooting in... May, they pushed it back sometime in fall, uh, but it is shooting in Hawaii and Atlanta, featuring The Rock, Kevin Hart, and Jack Black. Um, and uh, I, was actually, I was actually happy when I first heard the casting choice, because I'm like, at least they're not trying to remake the one that I was in, they're going to go somewhere different with it, because there's no way you could use those three guys to make anything similar. <laughs> and uh, I was actually had a conversation with somebody who's working on it, and it is a very, very different film, so that's going to be a lot of fun. But yeah, I'm trying, trying to weasel my way back in. <laughs> I mean, with the Rufio thing, it's like these cats uh, from the East Coast, they wrote the prequel to Rufio, like the prequel to Hook, how Rufio got to Neverland, mm -hmm. and it's super fascinating, right? Of course, it's like a hundred million dollar film, mm -hmm. which is crazy. But we're we're working on the animation version of it, so we're like pitching the animated for and it's a musical. Mm -hmm. um, nice. Okay, that's awesome. it's pretty good. I mean, the story is pretty sick, and the songs are pretty sick, and the whole folklore of like how we got the Trihawks and like mm -hmm. let's just put this like the Indians are involved, mm -hmm. which is crazy. So I, hopefully we can get that. There's a bunch of people that kind of want the property, and you know. It's weird because, like, again, I don't own the property, but the guys found me. I'm like, oh, you guys never done this before. I'm like, you don't really go. You ain't going to like Mark Hamill if you want to do the Star. But like, you want to do like some Luke Skywalker stuff? Don't go to Mark Hamill. He can't really help you. But, uh, yeah, they all kind of set up some meetings and figure that out. So hopefully we can get that one going. That should be pretty cool. Uh, but yeah, there's so much, so much more going on as far as production side and, and stories to tell and uh, I've been really involved in Asian American filmmaking and I created an arts collective downtown called We on the Eighth and so we've been uh, curating and helping to inspire the next generation of content creators with a bunch of great keynote speakers and workshops and uh, and also helping to build like what's going what's going to be next for, for the Asian American side of what's going on and working with a lot of young YouTubers 
like I said, like you know, Kev Jonga, Tim Delegato, uh, AJ Raphael, a uh, bunch of other cats with projects. So look for a wave of, of especially the next generation of Asian American content creators out there. Very cool. Yeah. Well, that's going to wrap up the panel, guys. But uh, where can they follow you on social media if they want? Um, I am at Mr. Bradley Pierce. That's M R B R E D L E Y P I E S. At Mr. Bradley Pierce. And I'm uh, at Dante Bosco on pretty much everything. So mm -hmm. Tumblr and Snapchat is Rufio Zuka. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. Thank you.